Hello, and welcome to Making Ethical Choices with Limited Resources, Lessons from Catholic Healthcare, a live webcast presented by the Catholic Health Association. Thank you for joining us. My name is Nadine, and I will be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using your computer's volume settings. There will be a question and answer portion of the webinar. If you have a question for the presenters during today's session, please submit them by writing in the question box at the bottom of your screen. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters. We are joined today by our moderator, Brian Kane, Senior Director, Ethics for the Catholic Health Association. At this time, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Brian for opening remarks. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, good day, everybody, and thank you for participating uh, in this special presentation from the Catholic Health Association entitled Making Ethical Choices with Limited Resources, Lessons from Catholic Healthcare, and how these choices are made in relation to the coronavirus pandemic. Before I introduce uh, our three speakers today, uh, I'd like just to begin with uh, a moment to, uh, to pray together and uh, to uh, ground ourselves uh, in terms of uh, our spirituality and uh, so I ask you to join me, please, uh, in uh, a prayer for uh, caregivers. May you see with tender eyes the wounds of those before you. May you hear with well-tuned ears the unspoken needs of those whose voices are muted. May you hold with gentle hands the bodies and the spirits of those you care for. May the beauty of soul, the strength of spirit, the wholeness of being, lead you, inspire you, and let you know your own beauty of soul, strength of spirit, and wholeness of being. May you know that as you care for others, God cares for you, sees you, and holds you tenderly. Amen. We are pleased today to be joined uh, by speakers from three Catholic healthcare systems around the United States. Uh, our first presenter will be Kevin Murphy, who is Senior Vice President of Mission Innovation, Ethics, and Theology for Common Spirit Health uh, in, uh, based in Colorado. Uh, Beckett Grimmels is System Director of Ethics for Christus Healthcare, uh, which is headquartered in Irving, Texas. And Leslie Kunal is Division Vice President for Theology and Ethics, CHI Health in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, our goal in terms of this presentation is both to uh, center our discuss ethical discussion within uh, Catholic uh, teaching uh, and just to talk a little bit about uh, the background of those principles and then uh, our three presenters will, will talk about how those principles are implemented within their individual healthcare systems and the challenges that uh, we are facing at this time. Uh, we also received a number of questions uh, that were submitted with registration so at the end of these presentations You'll have time both to address some of those uh, pre-submitted questions, as well as uh, the questions that come up during the course of, of today's conversation. So just to begin our uh, discussion, I would like to uh, just review briefly uh, the foundations for uh, our teaching on the allocation of resources and to remind ourselves that uh, although we are facing a crisis today, uh, we have uh, a long history of uh, responding to pandemics and epidemics in the church that goes back centuries. And we have uh, always gone to our uh, social principles of, of Catholic teaching to inform us about how we approach uh, health care and how we uh, best serve the needs of, of uh, everybody. And so the first um, principle that, that we really depend upon is, is really the idea of human dignity. Uh, namely that, um, uh, next slide please, uh, that uh, we see persons as being sacred in and of themselves. Uh, we do not use them as, as a ends, but we see them as, uh, uh, see them as ends and not as a means. Every person has an innate value. Uh, and, and so we wanna really uh, emphasize that the, the sacredness of the person is, is one of our central pieces. Next please. The second part of that is that we don't just exist as individuals, we exist uh, relationally in a community of relationships. Uh, 
and that we have to understand rights and responsibilities or access to resources as both having that communal aspect as well as an individual need. Next, please. And so this leads to the second uh, emphasis here, which is really the common good, uh, that we all together have a set of conditions to which we contribute, which benefit all of us, uh, and that it's neither the community by itself nor the individual. Uh, it's really seen uh, in, in, in the interplay between both the dignity of the person as well as in our own common good. Next. And so the last piece of this is, is the interaction between the person and the society is really this idea of justice, that uh, a just society uh, really uh, places an emphasis upon uh, the interdependent, interdependent relationships we have. And so individuals need to contribute to the good of, of all. Uh, we, we also should distribute the goods of society in a fair way among ourselves. And that we also treat each other justly or rightly uh, in individual relationships. Next. So all three of these mutually reinforce one another, the common good, human dignity, and justice. Operationally, we put these into practice in, in uh, a few different ways. The first one is really to emphasize the work that we're doing. And, and when we're looking here, especially at um, the needs of patients, we also need to pay attention to the needs of, of those who are working in Catholic healthcare, uh, that we, we support each other, we support uh, the work that they do. Uh, it, is, it is as important as the work that they are doing. So we, we, the work that they do is valuable to everybody. Uh, we must respect their rights and we, again, support them. Next. Solidarity, all of us share together. Uh, we, we view our relationships with each other and we support those relationships. Solidarity also includes a preference for the poor and vulnerable, and especially we're talking about allocation decisions. Uh, we need to keep in mind the needs of those who are unable to speak for themselves uh, and, and make certain that we do not discriminate on them. And actually, we need to, in some ways, uh, allocate more resources to those who are disadvantaged. Subsidiarity, uh, we want to try to um, make decisions as close to the point of impact as possible. Uh, that's part of the reason we want to have this discussion in terms of not only the principles or the, the policies, but how those policies are implemented by individuals at the bedside, how those things are carried out, uh, and, and the power that we need to give people to make those decisions. And our last uh, value is really this idea of stewardship, that we have a responsibility to use our resources widely and that they're for the good of all and we have to try to find the best ways of maximizing the use of the resources uh, for the good of everybody. So uh, with that brief uh, review of uh, our social uh, teaching, I, I turn it over to Kevin Murphy uh, from Common Spirit Health. Thank you, Brian. Um, I'd like to start with just a thank you to my uh, peers and colleagues across the ministry for their collaboration and conversation, which makes this conversation uh, possible. Uh, I'd like to start with the common ground that we seem to be sharing, not just within Catholic healthcare, but outside of Catholic healthcare, with source documents that we're all utilizing with current guidelines and protocols that we're creating. I've listed here probably five uh, source documents, source documents which seem to be consistent, um, again, across the ministry or outside of Catholic health care. Uh, certainly the articles that have been written uh, uh, by Christian and others uh, out of the Canadian uh, Medical Association Journal and also the CHEST consensus statements, the Utah Pandemic Influenza Hospital and ICU Triage Guidelines, the New York State Department of Health Ventilator Allocation Guidelines of 2015, and the Maryland framework for the allocation of scarce life-sustaining medical resources in 2017 all seem to be common ground and source documents that we are standing on currently. So for those of you who are interested in some of those documents, those are, those are ones that are consistent. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to what we're seeing with respect to common assessment tools, regardless of the policy there seems to be consistent assessment tools that we're all utilizing within our guidelines currently. Uh, we seem to be using consistent exclusion criteria for hospital admission. Uh, 
Uh, we seem to be using SOFA scores or a modified SOFA or Apache score. Uh, inclusion criteria for ICU and ventilator, Glasgow coma score, revised trauma score, triage decision for burn victims, the New York Heart Association functional classification, and also the Pew score. These eight tools seem to be consistently present uh, in those tools for clinicians to utilize as they're making assessments with respect to uh, allocation of scarce resources, especially clinical resources and ventilator. I'd go next to um, some of the clinical ethics standard work that we're seeing. Uh, when we start to look at policies, again, internal or external uh, to the Catholic Healthcare Ministry, there seems to be standard work, which is evident. Um, we're all striving for strong regional collaboration, and uh, especially when looking at transferring patients or or creating uh, models or protocols, we seem to be striving for that kind of collaboration. We all seem to have statements um, on patients that are treated with dignity and respect, regardless of race, ethnicity, national origin, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, et cetera. All our policies and protocols seem to have that kind of statement that is foundational. We're all recognizing the need to attend to the vulnerable as identified within directive number three. Triage and allocation criteria are all based on evidence-based practice and team assessment. There is a focus not to have allocation decisions necessarily made by one individual. Uh, all are supporting a team approach and all are demonstrating through these um, tools of evidence-based practice that these decisions are not simply made uh, on the basis of a personal clinician quality of life assessment. We're separating as well uh, those teams that are attending to the needs of patients and those teams that are responsible for the allocation of decisions. And that separation demonstrates a level of objectivity with respect to those decisions. We seem to be offering roles and teams focused on triage assessment and also roles and teams focused on uh, caring for patient, family and colleague support that would include palliative care, spiritual care and social work disciplines. Uh, we all seem to be focusing on, in our protoc protocols, uh, transition care plans when resources are not allocated to a, a patient. Uh, example could be ventilator and an emphasis on the, the work and the care plan we will do, uh, even if particular resources are not available to individual patients. We all seem to be emphasizing transparency in our communications with patients and family members as well. Uh, about decision making. Um, you're seeing some systems looking at how they might offer letters to patients um, that give them a context uh, for the environment that we're in and also our process with respect to decision making. And finally, you know, in the question that comes up around universal DNR orders for all COVID patients versus unilateral DNR orders for individual patients, we're seeing uh, not really a, a strong support with respect to universal DR or DNR orders, but really we're seeing ourselves go in the direction of unilateral DNR orders, perhaps after engagement with conversation with individual patients and individual family members. We would continue on to some of the clinical ethics questions that seem to be arising. Uh, we're seeing types of approaches certainly outside of Catholic health care, maybe utilitarian approaches. Uh, and I think we're seeing for ourselves that uh, we're more on the side of trying to save as many lives as possible with the resources that we have. The unilateral DNR order issue that we just uh, discussed, uh, we're really seeing it focused not on a universal DNR order, but perhaps uh, a DNR order uh, in conversation with patients uh, where a team may have to make a unilateral DNR decision. Um, we are seeing some questions raised around SOFA, uh, whether it is the best tool to use or not. Uh, we're seeing modified SOFA, uh, we're seeing Apache, but we are seeing that uh, there's quite a bit of support and validation for utilization of SOFA scores within these allocation decisions. Age is an issue you've probably seen in the media arise and it's uh, identified as not a categorical exclusion within the policies that we're seeing. Disability, again, not a categorical exclusion. Uh, as we continue with other issues, 
the issue of visitors comes up. We're seeing some cities, San Francisco being one example, where the city itself will make a statement um, and a requirement that uh, visitors not be allowed within entities or hospitals or nursing homes. Uh, some exceptions might be possible, we're seeing in some policies with respect to end of life situations, as long as visitors are, are um, well protected with respect to uh, PPE. Uh, with respect to duty of care, we see that uh, that's a very foundation as well. Uh, although we are seeing some cases uh, coming up with respect to clinician refusals, especially uh, sometimes if they have patients um, who have immunity problems, uh, or sorry, family members, if they have immunity problems at home. When all things are equal uh, with respect to allocation decisions, we are seeing different approaches arising. First come, first serve seems to be an approach which seems to be most supported. Um, we are seeing in some articles um, out there currently, the most current one would be Ezekiel Emanuel's article just published within the New England Journal of Medicine in March, which is proposing a preference for healthcare professionals um, with respect to allocation of resources, given that they can be re-engaged in healthcare delivery. Uh, we're also seeing some wonderment about that kind of a proposal and whether that would create a sense of mistrust uh, within the healthcare profession uh, from patients. Uh, years of life is another criteria we're seeing, as well as a lottery approach was also uh, proposed by that same article by Ezekiel Emanuel. What we're seeing is more are using a first come first served approach simply because of its, um, its equity, but also because of its ease of operation, operationalizing and timeliness. We're also seeing a request for appeal mechanisms of certain types. Um, the ability to request or change approved triage processes. Uh, retrospective deviation from approved triage process is another um, item or component with respect to appeal mechanisms. And finally, the possibility for reevaluation of patient because of incorrect or incomplete information. We are seeing um, within our policies those types of appeal mechanisms present. Continuing on, I wanted to offer you not just the first level types of ethics responses that we're seeing within our policies and protocols, but also wanted to kind of offer you a second level ethics um, unpacking of the environment that we're currently in. And clearly the environment that we're currently in can be understood as frontier territory. We will experience and face complexity and tragedy uh, within the environment that we're in right now we will attempt to tame it, uh, but we'll also confront limits and will be faced by limits. In that experience, we're more than likely to experience a sense of betrayal at times. No matter how good our protocols are, our tactics, and the work we're doing very hard to put certain approaches in place, we will experience sometimes a type of a, of a betrayal because some of our attempts, no matter how good they are or how hard we work, uh, will be found to be inadequate. And the challenge, the ethical challenge for us in these moments is our ability to be able to respond without blame or without distance, distancing ourselves from patients or distancing ourselves from each other. There will be times that we might uh, have an opportunity to go down the path of blame. Uh, and, We've found that in other scenarios, whether it's the HIV epidemic or other kinds of allocation issues or environments, sometimes we have uh, an orientation to move towards blaming the patient when our methods and our protocols don't work. As well, we can sometimes turn to blaming ourselves and ask ourselves the question, am I a good clinician? Am I a good leader? Am I a good person? We just find that those approaches or those paths don't engage us in, in the resilience that we're going to need. And the path of blame doesn't seem to be a path that supports us well, even though it is a very human path to go down. We'll rely upon uh, encounter versus technique. Even though some of our approaches may fail, we can always depend upon the foundation of one human person to turn to another and provide support. I had the opportunity to talk with clinicians this morning who are actively engaged in COVID surge areas. Uh, 
and they talk about the importance of themselves being present to patients, especially patients who are often alone. And I've talked to clinicians who've talked about taking messages from family members to patients uh, who are in a quarantined area and offering those messages to them and the joy and the sorrow they feel in those moments. Those are examples of encounter versus simple technique. And it's those encounters that will offer us hope uh, versus despair in this kind of environment. I wanted to um, offer simply a definition of hope, which I found helpful and have learned from a, from a colleague of mine by the name of Jack Leisher, who's no longer uh, with us. Jack passed a few years ago, but this was an explanation of hope that he liked and I was drawn to. It's from Vaclav Havel, and it states, hope is not the expectation that things will turn out well. It's the belief that there's meaning no matter how things turn out. I'll leave that definition uh, and that image as, uh, as a way to end at least my segment as we turn to uh, another colleague of ours uh, within the next section. Thanks, Kevin. This is uh, Beckett Grimmels with Chris's help. I want to delve into the weeds a little bit more than Kevin did. Not too much, but just a little bit to look at how at least we're looking at this in Christus and, and throw out some other ideas for some of these specific sections. I want to set the stage and say, uh, set the stage and say very clearly that we're talking about implementing these protocols when facilities are inundated by patients, completely overwhelmed and collapsed, when your resources are insufficient to meet the demand, resources being PPE, ICU beds, ventilators, dialysis machines, you name it, whatever that resource is, so much so that patients will die without that resource and patients are going to die because you can't care for all of them adequately or treat all of them adequately. And the last piece I want to say for setting the stage is transfer is not possible. If you can transfer a patient to another facility in your region, whether in your system or outside the system, um, that obviously would be the first place to go before looking at triaging decisions here. I want to talk a little bit also briefly about some second order principles. Brian talked about more of the first order principles. This is kind of the next set that glob onto some of those specific to a triage decision in a pandemic or a disaster. One is equity stemming from human dignity, the idea that all people have, are made in God's image and language equally, therefore they all have the same claim to healthcare resources that they need under normal circumstances. And in these circumstances, they, they all have the same claim necessarily, but we can't all meet those needs. And because we can't meet all of those needs, decisions that are made on how best to meet those needs should be based uh, and grounded in evidence-based clinical objective criteria, not subjective criteria, not based on one person or one physician's opinion, especially not judgments based on quality of life, uh, but based on objective criteria on who is most likely to benefit from these resources. How can these scarce resources do the most good? Another is transparency. Whatever decisions are made, the decision that is made, it should be clear to all those affected by it what decision was made and how that decision was made. The process for making decisions should be clear to everyone. We may not all like the decisions or the process, we may not all agree with them, but at least we understand why the decisions are made that way. I think the more people can be transparent about the process, the more likely there is to be acceptance of the outcome. Um, not that we're all gonna accept it necessarily, but it just helps set the stage for that. And then lastly, consistency. Decisions need to be consistent between triage teams, between facilities, and ideally consistent within the community locally as much as possible. If Hospital A is doing things very differently or before or after Hospital B and C are, then you're gonna likely overwhelm one resource wherever the community thinks they can get the best deal for themselves. Um, on top of that, there raises a justice issue if we're triaging hospitals, uh, ventilators at one hospital and not the other one that's just a few blocks away. Next, I want to talk a little bit about the triage team structure, how we structured this in, in, within Christus and how I'm seeing a lot of other systems do this, is that we have local or regional triage teams that are responsible for making decisions with regard to allocating ventilators or different medical or logistical supply questions, maybe even triaging who gets a test and who doesn't if tests are short, um, whether to do local transfers within a system or between systems, 
um, with hospitals at a, at a competitor. And then they are able to triage things up in questions that are more difficult, more complex, or need a larger view to a system level triage team, or even from a facility to a region. And that system level or larger regional triage team can look at things like transfer center requests within the own system, or even without, outside that system. Um, and then also provide consultation or look at questions that have come up. Right? If, if one region in the system is seeing one question and the, the system level triage team has answered it, then they have a ready pat answer for other regions should those arise. Um, we're, we're keeping track of those questions in a form that we use so that way we've got that ready to spit out the answer to someone else if it comes up in that region. Kevin mentioned exclusion, ex inclusion criteria. These are some of the ones that, that many hospitals are looking at. Acute severe neurological injury, a major immediate uh, brain hemorrhage from some kind of uh, recent injury. In-stage organ, fa organ failure, whether that's from the heart failure that, that Kevin mentioned or, or liver failure, but you could also look at uh, respiratory or renal failure as well. Patient wishes. Uh, I, I think part of the triage process should include some kind of goals of care discussion, just as you normally would for any patient who's either moving into the ICU or getting close to it, just to make sure that this is in line with what the patient would want. Some kind of long-term or even short-term intensive care life support is in line with what the patient would want. Not just in general, but especially in the current circumstances. Another is volunteers. Uh, would a patient be interested in giving up their, their spot um, for possibly receiving a scarce resource for others, kind of some out of love of neighbor or self-sacrifice? There was a story recently about a priest in Italy who was in his early 60s who agreed to and, and actually requested to forego any chance at life support uh, to give it to those who were younger than him or those who had a, a more likely chance of surviving. And he actually died as a result of that. There are obviously lots of others, but those are just some examples of them. And then in addition to hospital exclusion criteria, you have ICU inclusion criteria. So only patients meeting those two criteria at the bottom, or similar criteria, would be allowed into the ICU. So with the first set, if a patient meets one of those based on the high likelihood of dying in the immediate or future or during that hospitalization, those patients would not be admitted to the hospital. They would be sent to some sort of alternate care site, whether that's within your own system. We've looked at freestanding EDs. We take this freestanding ED or urgent care center, and that's our alternate care site for either those who are too sick or not sick enough to be put in the hospital. And then once patients are admitted to the hospital, only those other patients meeting those criteria at the bottom would get into the ICU. Once they're in the ICU, some sort of triage algorithm well, to look at delineating which patients are gonna be receiving a scarce treatment or not. Um, Kevin mentioned the Utah algorithm protocol. This is based on theirs and it divides patients into different categories. Again, whatever category you choose, I think is less important, or how you divide them up is less important than that there are categories and that they're based on evidence-based medical criteria, clinical objective criteria. This divides patients into four categories. The patients who are blue have the lowest chance of survival, even with that scarce resource. Um, using the SOFA algorithm, that's SOFA score of 15 or higher, it's an 80% chance of mortality. Um, per SOFA scoring. Yellow are the intermediate priority for treatment. They're ones who have a good chance of surviving with treatment, but also a good chance of not surviving even with treatment. Um, and then the red patients are those who are your highest priority, focusing the most efforts on them because they are the most likely to die without treatment, but the most likely to survive with treatment. And then the green patients are your worried well, those who are sick, maybe they're sick, maybe they need care, but it's not immediate care, not urgent care looking at some sort of site of care outside of, of the main hospital. And so both the, the way we treat the blue patients and the green patients in this algorithm, I think, speaks a lot to Kevin's point about the utilitarian criteria here. Blanket utilitarianism would say we do the greatest good for the greatest number, and if you're not in that greatest number, good luck to you. I, I think um, uh, for, from a respect for human dignity standpoint, those who are not going to be receiving that scarce resources still have a right to general ordinary care, comfort care as appropriate, and potentially other curative treatments that are not scarce. So for example, if ventilators are scarce, uh, 
but antivirals or antibiotics are not scarce, then those patients who are blue or green should have access to those non-scarce resources as well, assuming that there's a good chance that that can be effective in reversing their current course of, or condition. And then obviously once a patient, either red or yellow in this criteria, makes it into the ICU and is either receiving a scarce ICU bed or a scarce ventilator or scarce pressors or whatever that scarce resource is, you have some sort of sequential regular reevaluation to make sure that they are still well enough and have a good enough likelihood continuously to receive, to be continuing to receive that resource. And in the worst case scenario for us, that's a triage level three, you would be looking at potentially removing a patient from that scarce resource to give it to someone who is, has a higher likelihood of surviving. So if a patient moves from red to yellow or yellow to blue, to where we have an 80% chance of mortality in the current hospitalization, we would then be withdrawing that resource. And that means even potentially withdrawing a ventilator against the family's objections, the surrogate's objections, knowing that that patient has an 80% chance of dying, to give it to someone who has a 20% chance of dying with it, but a 100% chance of dying without it. Other things to consider, there are tons of other factors to go through, and Leslie's gonna to touch on some of those, but just a few points that I wanna make. Again, to emphasize, respect for human dignity means that patients who are too sick to receive that resource are not just kicked to the curb and put in a corner, but they receive other non-scarce resources, including some type of comfort care as appropriate. And if that means patients who are in this category receive all the pain medication, for example, pain meds are short, then those who are gonna live and receive the life-sustaining treatment that's scarce, maybe they don't get to receive pain treatment. So thinking about how you triage things to where is really important with remembering respect for human dignity means we still care for everyone. And, and Kevin mentioned also that triage team members should not be caring for patients um, who they're making triage decisions for just to mitigate that conflict of interest. Another question that's come up a lot, this is delving a little bit outside of ethics and I wanna be clear, this is not legal advice, this is just Examples of things that are already out there, liability protections for those on the triage team. That question has come up multiple times a day for us from physicians who will be making these decisions. How much am I covered? What does that look like? Michigan this week, the governor of Michigan uh, issued a, a, an executive order stating that triage team decisions made in accordance with their state algorithm would have some type of significant liability protection or coverage for those physicians. Virginia has it by statute. This would be almost impossible to do now in the current situation, at least by statute, because it's gotta be passed by the legislature, but at least it's theoretically possible that if you are making decisions as a physician in Virginia in accordance with their guidelines and the guidelines have been enacted by the state, then you would receive uh, liability coverage and protection for that. Another option is to have this, the triage team count as and be approved in a, a, a um, approved by the Medical Executive Committee as a peer review committee. And then that would give the triage team all the protections of peer review, all that comes along with that. So again, not saying one of those is better than the other, not endorsing one over the other, it's just saying those are three that exist. So given all of this, I wanna look at a few cases and using the particular formula and algorithm that I just went over, how would these patients um, go out? If you have one ventilator, one ICU bed, how do you figure out who gets that given these four patients? And again, the, the Maryland guidelines, I would recommend those for other cases that are different than these. Those pit a patient A versus B, but very often as we know, you don't have one or two patients, you might have seven or eight that arrive over 30, 40 minute increments. Um, so the first patient needs a ventilator. She's on high dose pressors because her blood pressure is low. She has no history of comorbidities. This is really her only uh, her only issue is acute response to a, a coronavirus infection. She's in respiratory failure, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a reaction to that. Um, she's in shock and she's got renal failure as a result of that acute renal failure. So her SOFA score is 13. You'll notice that is not a blue, it does not come out as blue, it comes out as a very high end yellow patient. Um, so the second patient needs a ventilator. He's got a history of severe emphysema, not end stage necessarily, but severe emphysema and he's on home oxygen he has respiratory failure only. So that may or may not be related to this particular um, illness of COVID. It may just be an exacerbation from his COPD. Again, when the triage team is making these decisions in the ED, especially when you get to, to level three, the, the worst case scenario, you're not gonna know a patient's COVID status off the bat. 
And for these two patients, you need to know right away whether to intubate or not. You don't have time to wait even for those rapid 45-minute uh, tests coming back. Um, patient C, looking at um, a patient who is, is in septic shock, she's on pressors because her blood pressure is low, has a history of IV drug abuse, but her only issue is septic shock, um, a SOFA score of four, so has a very high likelihood of surviving. And then the last patient uh, needs a ventilator. That's his reason for going into the ICU. He's got a history of um, class four heart failure, which is end stage, the worst that you can get, and he's having an active heart attack respiratory failure and heart failure. It may be because of um, COVID, it may not be. But looking at these in conjunction with the exclusion criteria for hospital admission coming out first, the patient D would meet exclusion criteria based on heart failure, end-stage heart failure. So he would be moved to some sort of um, alternate care site, not be admitted to the hospital based on his poor likelihood of survival with his heart failure. Um, patient A, Again, not having some sort of automatic exclusion criteria for her, but because of her very high SOFA score, not automatic with being 15 or higher in this particular algorithm, but certainly high enough that you would probably move to patient B or C before her, just given how seriously sick she is and her high likelihood of not surviving immediate illness. Patient B, I think a quick history on how bad his COPD is, how bad his emphysema is, um, could rule him out based on the exclusion criteria of end-stage organ failure. It may not, depending on, again, where he lies there. But then also looking at some of his respiratory numbers, how severe is it? Um, even though he has a, the lowest SOFA score there, his history there uh, may rule him out. So really focusing on a decision between patients C and B, probably leaning towards patient, patient C, just given her lack of history and where she is now in her SOFA scores has a very high likelihood of surviving. So with that, I will turn it over to our third presenter, Leslie Kunal. Well, hello, everybody. I um, am just delighted to be here to talk about this tough question with all of you and with my fellow presenters. Um, I'm coming to you from the middle of the country. You can see a picture in the background of Omaha, Nebraska. It's a, a picture I took in our old market area last Tuesday night. Um, Tuesday night happened to be the um, first of the nice fall or nice spring days of 2020. And typically, if you would have gone out on this street on that day, you would have seen people milling around and cars there and, and everyone just enjoying the sunshine. And as we know, um, 2020 is just not a normal kind of experience for all of us. And um, you see behind me a very different picture than all, all of that. It's, it's a more of a ghost town picture. And I think for me, um, the reminder of that and the context of that leads so much into what we're thinking about in terms of how do we think about this new normal or new not normal, so to speak. And how especially do we think about this in terms of our topic today, which is to figure out how we're going to um, approach and address and really wrap our heads around this idea of scarce resources. And for me in particular, serving this Midwest area, taking a look at what that means for us. Um, next slide, please. Um, you know, as we mentioned, as Brian and others mentioned in this, for, for us in Catholic healthcare, um, Brian said this, Kevin and Beckett have said this as, as well. We, we exist relationally and in community with each other. And that along with the dignity of the human person becomes that first and foremost focus of us in thinking about this idea of triage and triage response. And as we think about, like Kevin mentioned, the emerging ethical standards and the clinical standards in this, looking at how we collaborate on those regional levels, recognizing the needs of the vulnerable and thinking broadly about what vulnerability might mean, both in the populations that we serve, and in this case, the populations that we know are at greater risk, has been an interesting part of this uh, work. And, and how are we gonna work through these tough questions? Um, and I think one of the things that's interesting about this time is it seems like um, at least for us here in the Midwest area, still, there's a sense of, of still experiencing this as a novelness. And, and I think 
perhaps outside of the healthcare communities where we're having more of a conversation. But in the general public, while life as we know it has changed completely, there's still a bit of a novelness about it. We're reaching out to family and friends in different ways and having our virtual happy hours and our virtual gatherings and, and amusing on that. We're um, thinking about new ways to um, order from our favorite restaurants that are now doing takeout and deliveries. We're binge watching on a show that we might have always wanted to or figuring out what it means to work at home and teach your kids at home and be in those places. And I, I think that when we're shifting to this sense of this like, well, isn't this interesting modality in the general public, even as we see all the things on TV, we still have a sense of not necessarily wrapping our head completely around what it's going to mean when we start to look at some of the triage resources. And I wanted to kind of think about this and, and share with you some of what our what we've been working at in our division. Um, my particular division, my role covers um, hospitals and, and healthcare facilities and, and clinics across the states of Nebraska and Southwest Iowa and into North Dakota and uh, Northwest Minnesota. And so we have this blend of urban and suburban and rural critical access hospitals um, large tertiary um, trauma centers and community hospitals galore. And I think that as we're trying to figure out these triage mechanisms, it does take some creative thinking about what are those focus areas. For example, in thinking about our urban areas, we start to think about what does it mean when there are different community systems or hos different hospitals within a community? How do we share and collaborate across systems that are typically in competition with one another? What does it mean for us, particularly as a Catholic institution, that we may or may not be looking at things in different ways than perhaps some of our um, state-based or other um, public hospitals and entities? Um, what does social distancing mean in our urban areas when we're thinking about, you know, singing out of the windows at your neighbors like we're seeing across the country? or what it means to deal with those school shutdowns, work shutdowns, um, entertainment shutdowns, and thinking in terms of surge levels and the what to do if and when scenarios, um, and really balancing what we're seeing in terms of lower volumes than we usually have because we're all preparing for these surges. Um, reductions in elective surgeries, reductions in different services and, and procedures, and how we balance all of those needs as we reallocate staff and think about cross-training and do all of that. To think about what does this look like in our suburban or our community settings hospitals that um, may have a familiarity, for example, with receiving some of the care and services by telemedicine, um, consultations with specialty physicians into those community areas or thinking about how do we repurpose or relook at units that may not be currently seeing patients and perhaps now can become those places where people can go that we still accompany and provide the care for patients who may not now have access to those higher levels of care that they would have had in normal circumstances. Um, again, that balance of what does it mean to serve the communities that we serve. And I think what's been most interesting in thinking about this in, in terms of our rural areas is also, and, and, and of course in that our critical access hospital perspectives, is to figure out what, um, what are those ways we might see shifts in the kinds of services that are provided. Are there opportunities for expanding some of our areas and swing beds to be able to have those, again, places where people can be if they're not able to transfer? Um, but that brings up its own challenge um, in terms of the kinds of patients that would typically have been transferred to higher levels of care or different resources may now be staying in communities and staying in those places with a very big likelihood of not surviving and sort of transitioning in a different way. Um, staffing and bench strength. Right, so when we think about some of the triage team models that we're seeing emerge in, um, in the literature and emerge in some of these models, most of the triage teams will talk about 
rotating people on and off those triage teams so any one professional isn't in that role all of the time. But in our smaller hospitals, there may not be that bench strength to do that. There may not be the number of people to do that. So how do we really help to um, support as a system level? And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a bit. Um, next slide, please. I think what's been most interesting to think about this shift is to think about also what this means in terms of our first responders in our critical access in rural areas. And I took the liberty of showcasing my own little town I grew up in, uh, Shelby, Nebraska, and their, um, their all volunteer fire and rescue squad. And these are the people I grew up with and graduated with and love and, and um, not so much sometimes and, and you know all those ways that we are in relationship with one another everyone knows each other everyone helps out um, everyone helps their neighbors and helps their different places and really comes together in crisis in a very big way and I love that I saw this picture on their slide about their own mantra do your job treat people right all in attitude and all out efforts and I thought that's that's not bad as we think about all these things but I start to think about how their jobs and their roles and their responses will change and how they will wrap their heads around this idea that in typical normal times they may start a procedure in the field and just know that somebody comes in and they're transferred for that respiratory distress and they're put on a ventilator and everything moves forward and now in some of these areas in some of these times, if we see the surge levels we have, where will we go with some of those different kinds of transfers and triage situations? And how will we think about this and engage with the people in those first responder areas to um, wrap their own heads around this? Um, Kevin had a great slide where he was talking about um, the moral impact and the personal impact and also the the blame um, kinds of things and I keep thinking about how do we support people even in these kinds of roles and not not think about how we um, help to make sure that they're comfortable in knowing they're doing all in and giving those all out efforts, even when that might change or look different in terms of outcomes. Um, let's see. Um, I think that too, the whole sense of what risks the people on those first responders, and I don't just mean the volunteer and uh, uh, components, but really in all of our areas, figuring out what their um, typical protocols are and their own risks are. And I, I, I know one of the things that's been so interesting is to watch how we're seeing um, the community in general in the U.S. responding to first responders. But I think from our regional perspective, we've been trying to attend to that as well. And in fact, on our planning team for our triage committee, um, we've included our EMT coordinator so that we can be actively thinking about that. Um, next slide. Um, I, I think for us, we've been thinking like very much like Kevin and Beckett have both tried and sh uh, sh showed in their models as emerging, is to think of that kind of hub and spoke model so that we have a general or a system wide uh, triage team that may be connected with our incident command center on the division level that is designed and set up to help um, create some support for those local triage teams and perhaps even that reasonable amount of, of distance to some degree for some triage decisions so that those decisions don't fall directly on the shoulders of our direct care providers um, and trying to find that right balance. Um, being able to figure out what those rotating schedules will look like might look a little bit different in our command center at the division level, in our larger community hospitals, our trauma centers. It will look very different in our small community hospitals, again, because of that bench strength question, but we're working through figuring out what that might look like. Um, figuring out how we monitor where those tipping points are. Do they become tipping points or those to where we move into triage mode at the point of just the resources in one community? Or do we look at that as an entire system? 
um, thinking in terms of how we how we tap into the local community resources in terms of uh, the roles on those local teams. Um, and I think the communication skills are going to be incredibly key. Um, thinking in terms of how do we help support communication skills in areas that we already know are necessarily the strongest areas of communication in general in healthcare, which is having tough conversations with patients and families, and now interacting in that way of being able to share how does it look and how proactively can we have conversations with patients and their surrogates about there could be a potential that resources are limited and some of the decisions that we may need to make may change over time, depending on how many people are coming into our hospitals. Um, transparency has been the key throughout all of this and I think that is a good uh, mantra to have as we think through communication skills. Um, I think it's also, as Beckett mentioned, a really key place of thinking in terms of communication in the way we should always be thinking in communication with our patients and families. Trying to have open and transparent conversations about what are the relative risks and benefits of various interventions that are reasonably available for patients and having some open conversations of what happens if something's not going to work or not going to be very effective. And I think already as early as possible, helping people kind of wrap their heads around this idea that some of that may be limited by the amount of resources that we have. Um, but certainly being able to emphasize the sensitivity of that. Um, and I think what I've been noticing the most and trying to keep in, in, in uh, mind the most as we're thinking through developing this re regional and division strategy for triage is to figuring out, do we have at least a minimal window and maybe only in this kind of area I happen to be in, to, to wrap our heads around this a bit and plan and practice what this triage skills for be. You know, taking a look at, we might not be in triage mode, but if we were, what kinds of people would, what, where, what kind of um, um, numbers would we have in each of the various categories based on those SOFA scores? Or what should be thinking, we be thinking about already in terms of um, effective interventions, et cetera. Um, and I think that the more we can do this kind of idea of, of helping to support um, preparedness in terms of the people on our triage teams, perhaps even in terms of our community members to help people wrap their own heads around this idea that it could be that limited res resources do become limited, but finding that balance in a way that's not catastrophic and that's not sensationalized or that's not so dramatic that everyone's in a panic is going to be really a, a big part of it. And, and perhaps that's one of the things that we can do in terms of the Catholic healthcare response to this is to help start having those conversations based on that, that kind of community and common good level. And also thinking about how do we respect the dignity of every person how do we, how do we re realize that this impacts relationship in so many different ways? And that we think about how do we collaborate with and support each other throughout this process? Next, next uh, slide, please. I think for us, as I'm thinking about this, it is about, um, and, and currently where we are in our triage process and planning processes, is in a very different place than Beckett explained and, 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 and we're, we're, it's emerging as we're going. So what's become interesting um, to me is to see what are those questions that are emerging or those remaining questions that we have and we'll never answer them all for sure. Um, I think we'll just keep seeing them emerge as this, as this um, pandemic emerges. But there are some specific things that we're thinking about. So for example, what is the specific scope of that triage committee? Is it only critical care ICU resources and ventilators? Or is it everything? Is it as broad as PPE shortages? Um, what tips us into triage mode? Um, what, uh, who should be on the committee? Because I, I mentioned that before. And how do we help to maintain as much of that um, objective distance for people that are making those um, decisions and really what does that mean in a practical level the smaller the community and the smaller the hospital. Um, how do we support staff and providers 
who should be the one that communicates to patients and families about decisions as they're made. Um, and I think uh, two important questions become um, who are the vulnerable populations and what are those vulnerabilities? And really thinking about how that might vary across settings. For example, in a small community that has an incredibly large um, immigrant population, that might look very different than in a smaller community that has a pretty much every family's grown up in that community for the last 150 years. Um, those might look at some different areas and then trying to think in terms of how we engage with our public. You know, Kevin reminded us of the need for hope in all of this and the idea and belief that hope is about seeing the meaning no matter how things turn out. And another friend of mine just this week um, reminded me earlier that the color yellow is bringing him hope in all of this. And so um, hope and inspiration in the middle of all of these chaos and questions is what I wanted to leave you all with, um, with this particular slide. Um, and I wanna thank everybody very much for all of what you're doing out there in your various areas, um, as well as my other panelists and um, turn this back over to our moderator. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Beckett, and thank you, Kevin. Um, your presentations have already generated a number of questions, uh, and we do have a, a, a good number from uh, registration as well. So I'm going to start off with um, this question for uh, the panel. Um, we're asking to, if, whether DNR status or posts uh, should be updated in long-term care settings and whether this is an appropriate time to really talk about those things. Uh, with uh, nursing home residents? You know, Brian, I had the opportunity to talk to a, um, a physician in Tacoma, Washington this morning. She's board certified in both emergency medicine and palliative care. And when I asked her what was most important for us right now, she mentioned goals of care, advanced care planning. Whether you are a clinician, whether it's the people that she's seen as a palliative care physician who are in the hospital, or I think whether it's individuals in the nursing homes. Um, and that's where most of her work is right now. So that's particularly in Tacoma, Washington, where there is a surge. That's what she's like, uh, recommending as the number one piece that we need to look at now is advanced care planning post those conversations. Okay, second question. Um, how do you, um ensure that vulnerable persons and communities are taken care of in the midst of allocation of resources? And uh, well, I leave it at that. That's a hard question. I, I think there's always some concern that, that, that those patients will be particularly and in, in worse impacted than, than other patients would be. And even when it comes to first come first served, if all things are being equal, as Kevin talked about that a little bit, one of the concerns about that approach is that it tends to prioritize patients who have the means to get to the hospital quickly, who have health insurance, so they're going to quickly go to the hospital, whereas those who maybe don't have the means to get there or don't have insurance are going to put off uh, going to the hospital faster and faster. So they're going to come in last, and therefore they're going to be less likely to get access to those scarce resources, the, the life support when it gets scared, uh, scarce. I think that is a legitimate concern about that first come first served approach. And the difficulty with it then is what well, I know a lot of systems are looking at some type of lottery, then you have difficulties of well, then what's your time cut off? And, and if somebody came in five minutes, well, five minutes ahead of when you put somebody on the ventilator, do you take that person off after five minutes on the ventilator? Do you put, leave them off for a certain amount of time? I, th those are more difficult questions that I think you, you have to really turn to case management and social work to help out with a lot um, and look at your community resources. We're looking at some of our care coordinators uh, across, like nurse navigators, to help connect patients with resources and putting them on some of our, our care teams. Um, we, we've stood up teams that are looking at caring for the patients and families who are triaged to comfort care only and having those nurse navigators be a part of that team to help them with that. You know, Brian, just to add on to that question, uh, you asked public health officers, what's their concern right now? Uh, what I'm hearing is homeless and undocumented patients, uh, simply to be able to make sure that they're receiving best care at this time. Um, and so it's those vulnerable populations that I think people are worried about uh, 
And hopefully if you have street medicine uh, within your communities, that's been an important resource. Uh, but certainly those are two populations that are being looked at uh, strongly right now. Uh, do you have a way of breaking a tie when there's uh, limited resources and we have two patients with the same SOFA score? That's where that what I just talked about, the first come first served or the lottery are different options. Um, I, I, again, I, I don't know that there is a one versus the other that everyone is doing. It, it, there doesn't seem to be consensus on that particular question. Um, but th those are two of the options. And Kevin mentioned also potentially prioritizing healthcare workers insofar as they can help others later on. Okay. I would say there's also one of those things that's coming to mind for me is that um, that's another place where perhaps that is where your system, your enough removed triage committees can, can hopefully mitigate any other inherent biases, but it's gonna be such a balance between those immediate triage decisions and being able to respond in a timely way and some guidance from our, um, our, our either local or system-based triage committees. And it seems like being able to build some nimbleness into those decisions, but have a um, thought through and, and um, um, justifiable approach or an idea about how to address that is going to be really key. Um, and Beckett, perhaps it's um, working with those triage teams and training times to walk through uh, case studies like you had and say, hey, if, if we're faced with this, can we start thinking about this in the hypothetical? Because when it's not hypothetical, this might be the questions that we have. Okay, somebody else asked, what is the role of the ethicist and ethics committees at this time? I could uh, offer a start there. Um, you know, we've talked about different kinds of roles. We've talked about triage teams uh, within most places. I think those triage teams are being um, um, uh, filled with uh, members who um, are clinicians from a critical care background and who have an understanding of critical care. Um, I think ethics teams can be a support to those teams. They may not be actively involved in the decision making, but they can be helped helpful with respect to a decision-making process. The other piece is, are the teams that are offering support to uh, family members, to patients, uh, if they may not have been uh, the person where a resource was allocated to, um, to understand the full care plan that is gonna be offered to them. Um, that's, that's perhaps a, a, a more specific role that the ethics team or, or an ethics committee chair might be involved in in offering support to patient, family, or clinicians in those kind of situations as well. well one other is, and Kevin talked about appeals processes. Um, one of the ones that, that's out there, some kind of it, it's ethics committee members are in the appeals process or uh, perhaps an after action review. Um, if you don't have an appeals process built in, what kind of review are you doing to make sure that the triage teams were following the protocols appropriately? Uh, and, and the ethics committee certainly, I think, has a role to play in that. And then the other piece I'd say is, uh, you mentioned, Kevin mentioned caring for family members, but also caring for associates, uh, for, for those bedside clinicians and caregivers who are having to either make these decisions as a triage team or carry out the triage team's decisions um, on these, for these patients, having had no say-so into what that decision is. Uh, the repercussions for them as far as burnout, more of the stress, depression, um, even PTSD, I think, are going to be pretty significant if this really ramps up. And so being available for them from an ethics standpoint to help them walk through the moral distress will be key. How are you communicating your crisis plans to the community and to individual patients who are going to be affected by the triage decisions? We're looking right now with respect to, well, well first of all, um, I think for most of us in Catholic health care, we've shared guidelines and policies with each other to help each other come up to speed quickly uh, with respect to what guidelines might be best. And some of those guidelines I think are, are, are getting out into the community as well, whether they're being posted on websites, uh, et cetera. Um, I think the other thing that we've looked at is, is simply what kind of statement or letter might you offer individual patients um, you probably saw on CNN, the University of Michigan letter that received attention uh, 
Um, and there was a question whether, you know, it's good to actually be that transparent and, uh, and offer um, a picture of how the decision making is going to take place. Um, that's, that's the orientation we're going is to be able to offer uh, patients, family members, uh, a picture of the environment that we're in to set expectations and a view of how decision, make, decision making is going to occur. Um, much in line with what University of Michigan has done and other letters that we've seen from other health systems. I think another piece of that is communicating with your local community hospitals, making sure that they're aware of what you're doing so you can coordinate that as much as possible, but then also your, your primary care physicians and clinics to make sure that they're aware so they don't send patients to the hospital if they meet the exclusion criteria, that way you can kind of have some of that, that work off beforehand. Do you have an appeals process uh, for the triage decisions? Um, I'll, I think that's one of the things Kevin was thinking about in terms of, and Beckett mentioned too, that those could be those roles of either ethics committees or different sorts of dynamics. I think several of the emerging models um, and sample policies have built in triage, excuse me, um, appeals processes whether that be appeal by a physician that a particular um, a scoring might have been done inaccurately or appeals by um, others. And Kevin, you might want to uh, build on that as well. Yeah, Brian, if we think of the, um, the types of appeals mechanisms, so first, you know, request to change the approved process. We're in a learning environment. We're looking at, you know, what changes need to be made with the first edition of guidelines we've come out with. So certainly that kind of appeal to, to actually change the process if we're learning that something is better. What Becca talked about, you know, an after review by an action team to make sure that there hasn't been a deviation from what is the approved triage process. So that's another very good concrete example. And then I think, um, you know, most of these policies have reassessment of patients every 48 hours. And in, that, and in that reassessment, we're looking at, you know, is there incorrect or incomplete information? Is there a change in the clinical state? Is new, is new information available? So those, those reviews every 48 hours of patients when they've come, once they've come into the ICU is another example of an appeal mechanism around that kind of information. Two questions with regard to the SOFA scores. Uh, one question was, uh, it, uh, there seems to be um, uh, data out there that SOFA scores uh, do not have good sensitivity or specificity. Uh, can we ju justify using SOFA scores in light of their known deficiencies and our re risk of giving ourselves in the community a false sense of objectivity? And then the follow-up question from somebody else was, is, uh, should SOFA scores be um, reassessed more frequently than 48 hours? To the first question, I think there, there certainly have been concerns raised from a SOFA scoring perspective based in, in historical data. I, I, think, I don't think it necessarily is a concern about objectivity because the SOFA score is objective. It may not be predictive. I think that would be more of a concern. Uh, but I, I think the, the response that I hear from physician after physician after physician is, what's your alternative? there doesn't seem to be another alternative that has been as widely used and as validated as the SOFA scoring model or something else. I, I, I think if you have an Apache score that you'd prefer to use or some other scoring metric, I think that's, that, that would be, could be acceptable. I think the focus really is more on are we making this based on evidence-based criteria as opposed to some sort of subjective judgment. As for the reevaluation every 48 hours, on the one hand, you may want to do it faster if you're very short and you have, especially perhaps a patient that SOFA scores tend to be increasing as opposed to decreasing. Um, on the other hand, if you're going to give a patient a chance at having a resource and you're going to take time and you're going to spend that time on a patient, it, it makes sense to me to give them, give them a reasonable shot. Right? If you put a patient on a ventilator, you intubate them, and 15 minutes later, another one comes in, he's got a SOFA score that's way better, you've only given them 15 minutes. Are you really going to extubate them after 15 minutes being on a ventilator? That doesn't seem to make sense to me. And 15 minutes is obviously an extreme example, but you know, maybe it's 12. I don't know where that cutoff is. That, to me, is based on part physician judgment. 
Um, but it, it does seem reasonable to me to say we're going to give, if we've decided to give this patient a shot, let's give them a reasonable shot, whether that's 48 hours, 24, 12, to me that's physician judgment of that triage team. But. And Brian, just to add on to what Beckett said about SOFA scores, you know, just talking to two cardiac physicians again last night on this issue, because it does, this question does come up around the validation of a, of a SOFA score um, compared to a modified SOFA or Apache. You know, their comments were that uh, modified SOFA was considered less helpful due to the limitation of point of care device. Uh, Apache, they felt very person uh, dependent. And for that reason, not chosen as a tool of choice. Uh, they really felt that SOFA was well-studied standard and has been more validated than the modified model. Okay. Uh, let me see. And I believe you've already answered this, but I just would like to, let's go over it one more time. Is it ever ethical to remove patients who are not actively dying from ventilators? Potentially, yes. I mean, I, I think you could say in general, a patient, for example, who has quadriplegia and has been on a ventilator and has come to the conclusion that this is now disproportionate for whatever reason, um, they may not be actively dying, but that could be the case. And that's true in general. But in this particular case, yes, if you have a patient who, again, based on whatever criteria you're looking at, is you've determined has too high of a mortality rate, and you can show that with evidence-based um, evidence, then I, 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 yes. To give it to someone else who's more likely to die, yes, or less likely to die, yes. Okay, I think uh, we've covered most of the topics. There were multiple questions in the same topic, oftentimes, but I think we've covered most of the, the basics that we could do here. So um, let me uh, just conclude, first of all, by thanking our present uh, presenters, Leslie and Beckett and Kevin. I think this was very, very helpful. Um, I also uh, will direct people to the Catholic Health Association website where we have a COVID-19 uh, page and there's a number of ethics uh, pieces that are um, listed there. Uh, and then lastly, a number of people have been asking about um, the references that we've mentioned. Uh, we will be sending an email out to everybody uh, that can link you to those uh, resources uh, so they'll be easily available for you. Uh, I appreciate uh, everybody's participation today. Nadine? Thank you, Brian. Thanks, colleagues. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Happy to help. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the Catholic Health Association, I would like to thank you for your participation in today's event. A recording of this event will be sent in an email and will also be posted on CHA's website at www.chausa.org forward slash coronavirus. This concludes today's program. Thank you and have a great day.